So this was this the, what we saw yesterday. I would call it controlled escalation. It was designed to send a message to Israel, but not cause such devastating loss of life that they, Israel would feel they had no other choice but to respond. But but I think you know this is going to get out of control, and one of the one of the key targets in this is oil. Uh, so a lot of people are making the bet that yeah, this is going to lead to. Uh, a uh, uh, cut off of supplies of oil coming out of the Persian Gulf. Larry Johnson, how are you? I am well. Thank you for the invitation. I thank you so much for coming on. And again, I want to shout out your site in the beginning here, sonar21.com, to all my viewers that are not familiar with you. Um, and many of them are, but uh, that want to visit your work uh, on the internet, go to Sonar 21. So when I originally wanted to have you on, I wanted to talk about Russia and Ukraine. And I still want to talk about that, but a lot has happened in the last 24 hours. And I want to start what's going on in the Middle East, what happened yesterday. And I want to get your opinion on that. My question really is, is Iran launched an attack on Israel. Um, and I want your opinion on that. Was this just a flexing or is this an escalation here? Are we at the point of getting to the point of no return? Uh, well, we're probably at a point of no return. I hope I'm wrong, but um, this, you know, this really all has been caused by Israel. People don't like to hear that. You know, to say that in the United States, you're immediately accused of being an anti-Semi. Uh, nothing of the sort. I right? actually sort of shocked to find myself in the position I am today with respect to my views now on Israel, given where I was before. I would have considered myself before a real, let's call it staunch, stalwart defender of Israel. But what what they've been doing to unarmed civilians, and if we, if we if the definition of terrorism is basically the use of violence of any type, whether it's a firearm, explosive, um, bomb, you know, the bomb clubs, you know, pick pick your tool, anything that's used against civilians who have no means to defend themselves, that to me qualifies as terrorism. I don't like to get into the whole political labeling business. Uh, because if we, you know, if we then go by the strict definition of terrorism that the United States has put into law, well, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, George Washington, they were terrorists. Okay. So th that puts us in a position to say, okay, well, we find some terrorism acceptable. But, but, but what's happened is that Israel has used the excuse that there's, they are victims of, a terrorist, of terrorist attacks and therefore they have to fight terrorism, which on the surface seems to make sense, except sit down and actually look at the numbers. And it's not my numbers. Go to the, the Israeli foreign ministry uh, has published every Palestinian attack since August of 2000. They separate out the uh, t the, what's happened since October 7th. The October 7th and ensuing war in Gaza is sort of uh, analyzed separately. But but when you go through those numbers, uh, you, you find that uh, over a 24-year period, uh, less than 1,500 Israelis were actually killed in what could be considered acts of terrorism. Now, I don't want to minimize the loss of 1,500 lives, but for God's sake, you know, we lost almost three times that many on one day in 9-11. And we're talking here over a 24-year period. So that's not exactly what you'd call a terrorist tsunami. Now, with, with, with that as background, um, Israel claims that uh, they, they had uh, 1,139 people killed by Hamas on October 7th. Um, there is uh, much credible evidence to suggest that as many as 50% of the Israelis who were killed were actually killed by Israel itself. Uh, and as part of their Hannibal doctrine, uh, that to prevent people from being taken hostage, it's better to kill them. But, but let's just go with the full 1,139. That, that, that was all Hamas. Well, since then, Israel's killed 43,000-plus 
men, women, and children. The vast majority of them are not fighters. And then it extended that where it's going into uh, into Beirut and into Syria, and it's carried out bombing. So the first, uh, what was started, so what really started this escalation that has led to the missile strike yesterday was the April attack on an Iranian embassy. It was a consulate. And uh, they killed uh, some senior IRGC officials. Well, that's a clear violation of international law. Uh, it, it is, it's a war of crime. And yet Israel did that. So in response, Iran launched uh, a, a, a wave of drone, cruise missile, and ballistic missile attack uh, on one day against Israel. But what they did in this, they coordinated it in advance. They told the United States what they're going to do. They told the Turks. They told the Jordanians. Everybody knew it was coming. It wasn't going to be a surprise. And they were not intending to go hit strategic targets in Israel. Uh, the, the, their goal was really to show what they could do. And, and they had used a lot of actually old, outdated, um, you know, drones and, and cruise missiles. And, you know, they were, they were sending Israel a message saying, this is what we can do to you. At the very end of that attack, uh, Iran did use some, uh, sort of a, a hypersonic missile of some sort. And it, you could see it, it came down and then it deviated. <laughs> So they actually had a, something to maneuver, which is, you know, remarkable technology. Uh, well, neither the West nor Israel took that on board. And they said they declared it as a major, major defeat. Uh, so uh, uh, that Iran lost. And so it was after that, then, when uh, the new president, Pazeshkian, was sworn in uh, on his, uh, while well, he's been inaugurated with uh, 24 hours, Israel carried out an assassination of Ismail Haniya, the chief negotiator for Hamas. And, you know, to, it'd be like inviting a guest to your house and having somebody come in and kill him. All of a sudden, you know, you're, you're obligated to protect the guest in your house. Uh, so out of that, there was then this expectation that Iran vowed it was going to re retaliate. Well, what we now fi find out is that the United States and other European countries made assurances to the new president, Pazeshkin, saying, hey, look, don't retaliate. Don't, don't, don't feed into Israel's cycle of violence. If you, if you don't retaliate, I promise you there's going to be a ceasefire in, in Gaza. And not only will there be a ceasefire, but we'll, we'll move forward on the two-state solution. Now, within a Iran system of government, the, the Supreme Leader Khamenei, the Ayatollah Khamenei, he's actually the, the decision maker. Uh, the president is supposed to execute. Well, the Ayatollah de decreed that there was going to be a retaliation, but the retaliation didn't happen because Pazeshkin believed the West uh, with respect to this. And so then in the course of the next couple of months, you get the analysis in the West that the Iranians are weak. They don't have the ability to respond. They're afraid of Israel. And then Israel stepped up its attack, and then it really culminated uh, two weeks ago with the pagers that were in, in the hands of, uh, let's call them the civilian administrators within Hezbollah, uh, blew up, killed about 50-some, injured three, 4,000. And then that was followed by uh, the assassination of uh, the Sheikh uh, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the uh, Secretary General of, uh, Hez of Hezbollah, along with a senior Iranian general. Well, it's like two days after that, Pazeski comes out, and you know, I'm amazed he admitted this, but if he was like, God, the Americans lied to me. It was like, really, dude? <laughs> you're, sh you're surprised at that? And I guess that just uh, infuriated, infuriated senior military commanders within the Revolutionary Guard in Iran. And, and basically they said, hey, the gloves are coming off. And so they, they launched yesterday this barrage of about 188 missiles. Now, I know we're going to probably talk about Ukraine a little later, but this is, this is where now the Israelis are acting, acting like they've been getting given instructions from Ukraine on how to react to missile attacks. 
Because up in Ukraine, every time the Russians would launch a missile attack, the Ukrainians would go, yeah, we shot them all down. Yeah, we shot them all down. None, none got through. <laughs> Meanwhile, yeah. you're seeing the explosions go off everywhere. So that was Israel's came out to, oh, this was a failure. Now, I'm not watching Iranian television. I'm watching the broadcast, you know, CNN, you switch over to Fox, uh, so you go to uh, some social media platforms. It was raining fire down from the heavens, and you could see an occasional Iron Dome missile go up, and it's, it's going up, and a missile's coming in, and it just flies past it. Didn't intercept, you know, hardly intercepted anything. They may have intercepted, you know, one out of nine, one out of ten. Uh, so when you're, you know, when you're talking almost 200 missiles, maybe they intercepted a total of 20, but the rest were impacting and, and just... And they were targeted, targeted on military bases, not civilian areas. And, and this, is, this is really the big difference between Israel and Iran. The Israelis love to claim, and the United States repeats it endlessly, that Iran's the number one sponsor of terrorism in the world. Show me the data. Back it up. Show me the attacks. So I can show you the State Department data from my old office, now called the Bureau of Counterterrorism. The statistics they use, they're called uh, country reports on terrorism. They're collected by the National Counterterrorism Center, formerly of the CIA. And those statistics show that over the last five years, the top 10 terrorist groups in the world in terms of attacks, activity, uh, not a single one of them are sponsored by, paid for, trained by Iran. Not one. They don't have any official or unofficial ties with Iran. So you got to sit back and say, huh, how, how can Iran be the number one sponsor of terrorism when all the major terrorist groups are actually have nothing to do with Iran? And it's just a convenient label. But if we're going to use the metric of who's killing the most civilians, the, that terrorist is Israel in terms of and, and, and again, they're doing, it's one thing you say, okay, we want to assassinate Nasrallah. You know, I would, again, I counsel against policies of assassination because they usually can, can have a lot of blowback on you. But that's not what Israel did. To kill him, they killed four or 500 other civilians. And they don't care they're, because as far as they're concerned, they're not really human beings. They're, they're untermitch, they're, you know, uh, subhuman. So... Uh, as a result of that strike yesterday, if Israel's rational, they'll say, okay, we couldn't stop any or most of the Iranian missiles. We had it. We were incapable of stopping it. And we knew it was coming because Iran warned the United States. It informed the United States and it informed Moscow what it was going to do. And I guarantee you that if Washington was informed, they turn around and told the Israelis, hey, get ready, here they come. Mm -hmm. And uh, it gave the Israel time if they wanted to try to move some of their key assets. Uh, but nonetheless, even though they knew it was coming, they were unable to stop Iran. At this point, there should be step back. There should be looking for negotiations and, okay, we need to, we need to stop this escalating violence. But that's not what the Israelis are going to do. Uh, Netanyahu is surrounded by these, uh, they call them Zionist crazies. Uh, ben ben Gavir, uh, Beliziel uh, Smotrich, uh, and they're just they're wild fanatics. And they're vowed that they're going, to, they're going to attack Iran. And I know I've got, uh, I have some acquaintances who are Z American uh, Zionist is about the best way to describe them. And, and they live in a fantasy world. Oh, yeah, Israel's going to go blow up all of its oil, it runs oil fields, and they'll take out its nuclear facilities, and, and they'll end this. And I'm going, you know, Israel's vowed that they were going to defeat Hamas. And we're, what, 12 months later? Is Hamas defeated? No. And yet here's Israel fighting Hamas. In, in an area that's uh, 25, 26 miles long, five miles wide, and they can't defeat Hamas, 
And now they're going to go to Iran, which is probably 200 times minimum the size of Palestine. I mean, it's a massive country. It's four times as large as Iraq. Mm-hmm. And they're going to bring it to its knees? No. So uh, Iran has already said that if Israel retaliates and, and launches any strikes into Iran as a result, any more strikes into Iran as a result uh, in response to what Iran has done, Iran's going to hit back at Israel this time harder. So they won't warn them in advance, and they'll hit them out of the blue, and they will cause much more destruction to the Israelis. So this was this the, what we saw yesterday. I would call it controlled escalation. It was designed to send a message to Israel, but not cause such devastating loss of life that they, Israel would feel they had no other choice but to respond. But but I think you know this is going to get out of control, and one of the one of the key targets in this is oil. Uh, so a lot of people are making the bet that yeah, this is going to lead to. Uh, a cut off of supplies of oil coming out of the Persian Gulf. And that, that's definitely possible because Israel, Iran has vowed that you attack our oil fields, we're going we're gonna to take out every oil field in the Gulf. So just be aware. And they could also shut down shipping uh, tanker traffic coming out of the Persian Gulf. That, that was going to lead me to my, you more or less answered it, but that was going to lead me to my next question in, in this escalation. And, and again, we're all praying that, and that's not a good strategy, but we're all praying yeah. it doesn't escalate. Um, do you see oil, I mean, do you see Israel going after the oil fields? I mean, because that would be, I think, the that would be World War Three if that happens. Yeah, no, I, th- I think they will. Uh, they keep talking about wanting to go after Iran's nuclear facilities, but you know those facilities, uh, the key, the critical ones to the uh, that would involve possible weaponization for Iran, they're buried deep underground. Uh, I mean, I was involved with uh, the U- they're scripting and executing uh, U.S. military oper- uh, exercises for U.S. military special operations forces. God, this was like 15 years ago, and we did, we did one specifically on what are called hardened, deeply buried targets (HDBTs). You know, if you taught if working in the military, you got to have an acronym. Everything's got to have an acronym, and uh, you know, just looking at the what was required back then to try to launch, carry out a successful attack on a facility that was buried deeply underground. You know, it was, it was daunting. No, it was very, very little chance of success. And, you know, despite, you know, top, Tom Cruise and Top Gun 2, where they are able to, you know, fly in there and blow it up and, you know, they're, they're a great Hollywood ending. This ain't Hollywood. And uh, I, I think um, Israel's going to face some real obstacles. Now, the one of the wild cards, uh, in the aftermath of the attack on uh, Hania, the murder of Hania. Uh, Russia stepped up its uh, cooperation and support of Iran. And in fact, they've been negotiating sort of, let's call it a collective defensive uh, defense agreement. Uh, you've already had military cooperation between Russia, Iran, and China and Iran. It goes back at least four years, probably five years. Uh, the first exercise, I believe, was done uh, so in 20, uh, 2019, so yeah, it's five years. And that means the planning for it probably started in 2018. So, you know, six years. Well, uh, Russia's in a position to deliver to Iran air defense systems, S-400, uh, the best in the world. There's, there's nothing out there that's better except for Russia's S-500 and S-550 systems. Uh, but, uh, but has brought those defense, if they brought those defense, air defense systems in and then placed them around the key oil installations, for example, key military bases, uh, maybe in key uh, nuclear sites, now, then it, even if Israel launches ballistic missiles, including nuclear ones, uh, the odds are fairly high that, that Iran, if it has those systems and there are Russian technicians operating them, 
that they'll be able to take him out and uh, defeat the attack. So if that happens, that means the oil fields will remain intact and, uh, the, you know, we'll be dealing with perhaps a, a, an oversupply, not an undersupply. Right. So a lot, a lot really hinges on, you know, who's willing to bet that uh, Iran's got the air defense system in place and can defeat the Israeli missiles and who wants to take the opposite side of that bet? Because well, the, if, if, uh, if Israel succeeds in striking those oil fields, then yeah, this, it, it will disrupt not just Iran's flow, but I think the entire flow of oil out of the Persian Gulf. Yeah. It, it will be, be, you know, good news if you're a Russian because, you know, they'll be making what, $200 a barrel. So, right. Yeah, Lowen. So you wrote a great blog post just recently. And when I say great is well done uh, a couple of days ago, I don't want to say it was two days ago about how the Israel is invading Lebanon as we speak. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And this looks a lot like Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My question to you is really the motivation. I mean, on the network television, they'll say it's to you know, they're going out door to door, reading out terrorism, but it seems to me like this is a war now that Israel can't win because they don't have the resources and manpower. And my question is, is would you agree with that, that they can't win that because of uh, resources? And number two, it seems like we are getting sucked in really quickly to this because they're not going to be able to accomplish what they want without, without U.S. help. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, they couldn't accomplish what they wanted with our help. I mean, you know, we, we need to look in the mirror. We were, you know, I'm sure you knew somebody when you were in high school who was like the star middle linebacker, busy, you know, really fit, put together. Then, you know, maybe 30 years later, you go to the high school reunion, shows up. Well, he weighs 150 more pounds than he did in high school. And uh, he's certainly not in shape. But if he imagined that he's still what he was in high school and then goes out and tries to play football, he'd die. That's sort of what the U.S. military has become. And, and Israel is, is, is equally unprepared. They're not as good as they think they are. That's the problem. Uh, there, there, there is this, I, I have had dealings with uh, the Israeli government, Israeli military, and, you know, the, the, the biggest problem the biggest problem is their their attitude. It's it's, it's total arrogance. Uh, you know, I do I do a lot of uh, I'm a firearms instructor, and I actually train instructors. And and the one thing that you got to have that's more important than knowledge or skill is the right attitude. If you've got the attitude of I know everything, you don't have anything to teach me. You're dangerous, because. That inability to have some humility and to be prepared to learn can make you lead you to make some really brass, dumb decisions. And that's Israel right there. Uh, nobody can tell them what to do because they're the best. And if, you know, you, you know, there's, so look, look what we did with the page. See, that's that's how good we are. You're going, yeah, you kill a bunch of civilians and alienated more of the world against you. That's exactly what you need to become isolated. Yeah, that worked. That really worked out well. So here is Israel, who's now totally dependent upon the United States in much the same way that Ukraine is to sustain its war effort. If it comes down to supporting Ukraine or supporting Israel, uh, Ukraine's the adopted child, okay? <laughs> Israel's natural born. So, you know, it's going to get the best. They get... You get 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 what we have to give them. There's more lobbyists in Israel, I guess. You know, it. <laughs> well, I mean, Ukraine's made a good effort at trying to buy Washington, but they don't have Israel money. You know, yeah. Well, they got the uh, apex got some walking around cash. It's pretty serious, and they've got a track record for being able to take out uh, members of Congress who aren't cooperative with and offering to perform the act of fellatio upon them. So, um. Here, here's Israel now trying to start a five-front war. They're fighting in Gaza. They're conducting operations in the West Bank. Now they want to go into Lebanon. And 
And in Lebanon, unlike uh, Gaza, Lebanon's three times that southern part below the Latani River is three times the size of Gaza. And it is mountainous terrain, number one. Uh, number two, Hezbollah has dug underground fortifications into these mountains where they literally, they're big enough you can drive cars and trucks through the corridors, okay? So we're not talking some narrow, uh, cramped space. Uh, even uh, even people with claustrophobia would feel comfortable down there. Even, uh, 18 years ago, in 2006, uh, Israel tried to invade southern Lebanon to clear out Hezbollah. Hezbollah fought him to a standstill and forced him to withdraw. Uh, they, Israel suffered, I think, around 1,500 casualties, uh, you know, killed in action, proud as that. Uh, so they haven't gone back in 18 years. Well, here, in the ensuing 18 years, Hezbollah has uh, dramatically increased its military capability. In 2006, it basically had anti-tank guided missiles. That was it. Uh, didn't have drones, didn't have artillery, um, didn't have sophisticated precision missiles, and both ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. Now they do. But on top of that, they've got, uh, you know, at least a cadre, of probably 20,000 guys that are combat veterans. They've been up fighting in Syria against Sunni Islamic extremists, you know, ISIS, al-Nusra. And, uh, you know, they, they, you get, the only way you learn some of this is you go out and do it. You know, you don't learn. You don't learn to play golf by sitting in your chair watching, watching on TV. Guy get out and swing the club, and that's sort of what Hezbollah did in Syria. They got out and swung the club a lot. So here's Israel going to go up against them, and we've already had the initial report of about thirty, uh, which is a platoon size element for, in the Israeli army. Uh, they got uh, basically wiped out last night. Uh, they, they went in. They, they got ambushed. Uh, the reports are eight dead, uh, the rest wounded. Uh, the helicopters were flying in and hauling, hauling them back. They're saying there are 37. And these are the uh, Israeli hospital issued that there are 37. They received 37 casualties. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's what Israel's going to face if it tries to continue into yeah. uh, Lebanon. They're saying they want to destroy Hezbollah. They They're not going to destroy Hezbollah. Yeah, they killed Hassan Nasrallah. They killed some other top party leaders. Hezbollah is not a fragile uh, organization that is dependent upon one or two people. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is robust, it's flexible, and they, they train new leadership from the get-go mm -hmm. because they, they anticipate they're going to be killed. And mm -hmm. so someone's going to carry it on. This is, they, they don't, they, you know, they don't view this as a conventional human uh, timeline of, I'm going to live to 70 and die. This this is about eternity. They mm -hmm. believe that when they die, that they're going to go into paradise, and you know that uh, w what they do here on earth does matter uh, in terms of the afterlife. So, mm -hmm. the, so they're genuine, generally not afraid to die. That's mm -hmm. what Israel is up against. So, let's go back to the different fronts. So now they're trying to fight uh, Hamas in Gaza, Bata PLO in the West Bank. Uh, some elements of Hamas there, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. Then they're also talking about they're going to have to fight the Houthis, who are continuing to attack them. And then uh, they want to fight Iran now. Mm -hmm. So they don't have the economy to sustain this. Moody's has already downgraded them twice. I wouldn't mm -hmm. be surprised to see them get downgraded a third time. They're going to be a junk bond territory soon. Yes, I wouldn't buy those bonds. Yeah, yeah. No, this is uh, the, the, the literally the very existence of Israel could be at stake because they will so overextend themselves. Their army is, uh, is, is largely comprised of reservists. Well, where do these reservists come from? They, they're normally, they're employed in the economy. So you pull them out of the economy, you don't have somebody else to just plug in and replace them. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're losing. Uh, that part of the economy, a significant part of the uh, is Israeli economy was tourism. People right. would flock to see, you know, the holy city, Bethlehem. They ain't going. 
too damn dangerous. No, nobody wants to be there. Yeah. So uh, they're they're getting they're getting damaged economically that way. Then with the Houthis down in the Red Sea, they've cut off the flow of all maritime traffic into uh, the southern port of Islet. And you know, remember, th this goes back to your other question about U.S. involvement. Because remember, last December it was. Uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin announced with great fanfare, Operation Prosperity Guardian. Boy, we're going to go in there and show those Houthis who's boss. We're going to open up the Red Sea. And how'd that work out? We, we pulled our aircraft carrier out. We couldn't stop the Houthis. Yeah. God, you know, these guys are they're living in the 15th century. They got curved knives on their belts. They walk around in sandals. Yeah. You know, and... There's a mighty U.S. Navy. Couldn't stop them. And yeah. so to this day, the, the flow of any maritime traffic into Israel is shut down. And the Houthis are still, you know, Israel's bombed them a couple of times. We've bombed them a number of times. And, and they're like they're like that Timex wash commercial, man. Takes a licking, but keeps on ticking. Right. And that's what, you know, so. Um, and then if we try to take on Iran... With what? Iran has vowed that if the United States is involved in any way in supporting, aiding an attack by Israel on Iranian facilities, they will bomb our bases. And we got big bases. The biggest one is in Qatar and Al Udid Air Force Base. I've been there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not that far if, if Iran decides to use one of its uh, hypersonic missiles. Reportedly, they got missiles that will travel um, uh, upwards of Mach 9, Mach 10, 10 times the speed of sound. So we, we have no means to stop it. And if yeah. they even got Patriot missile batteries out, the, the Patriots are useless. Yeah. So, th I mean, this is, uh, and this, this sort of exposes another of the problems we mentioned about Israel's military strength. Um. They do not have a local defense industry that can sustain production of critical material. And then they run into a situation with that, like the Iron Dome. We saw that even though the Iron Dome failed to hit the most of the inbound ballistic missiles, you understand that system, when it operates, it fires two missiles out of the Iron Dome, at least two, sometimes three, to attack an incoming target. Well... Our, 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 uh, what's comparable in the United States to the Iron Dome is the Patriot missile battery. The number of missiles that are produced every year by Lockheed Martin, 550. And I'm not talking about the launchers. I'm talking about the actual missile. Mm -hmm. So if just do the math. Yesterday, let's say that uh, Iran fired 200 missiles and that if uh, Israel fired... Uh, Iron Dome missiles at every one of those 200 missiles, we're talking minimum 400, uh, uh, upwards to 600 missiles fired in one day. That that basically represents what Lockheed Martin could produce in one year. Right. So all Iran's got to do that is, you know, do that three or four times. All of a sudden, you've exhausted Israel's ability to defend itself from the air. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, it's so... And the Iranians aren't stupid. You know, they're not supermen, but they're not stupid. So you mentioned, like, they're opening up this war on five different fronts here. Let's talk about the wars that we have going on, even though they're, air quotes, not official. The wars right. in, um, in Ukraine here. To me, it's just absolutely insane and cr crazy that NATO, well... Zelensky wants to have missiles to lob into Russia. We're supplying them. And Putin's telling us, if you do that, and I paraphrase, obviously, but if you do that, that's a provocation of war. Yes. So, and then all you hear from the Western media is how Ukraine is in the fight and needs more resources. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot yeah, of gas, a lot of gaslighting going on. Yeah. Talk to me about Russia and Ukraine. Where does this end up? Well, let, 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 let's step back and look at uh, the U.S. military capabilities because that's where, where people they need to recognize how much trouble we're in. Uh, there's a uh, there's a 
great book uh, by an American, a Russian, you're born in Russia, but he's an American citizen now for 34 years, Andrei Martiano. I know who you're talking about, yes. And Andrei's book is called Losing Military Supremacy. Mm-hmm. You can get it on Amazon. I just strongly recommend that people get it and read it because, and he wrote this seven years ago, and the situation's only gotten worse. So right now, the Army is unable to meet its annual recruiting goals, or it was unable, but now it's meeting its recruiting goals. But you know how it's meeting its recruiting goals? Initially, it said it wanted to recruit 70,000 a year. Now it just said, no, we'll just we'll go for 35. Oh, we got our goal. <laughs> so, you know, it's like uh, you proclaim yourself the world's greatest track, track athlete because you met your goal in running the Seven minute mile. Well, that's where your original goal was to run the four minute mile. Yeah, that's too, too, you couldn't do it. So you go to seven minutes and, yeah, I'm a winner. You know, get your participation trophy. Um, you got the Air Force that fields the F 35 jet combat aircraft, tune of $100 million minimum a copy. And out of the, all those, uh, out of the, number that are currently in the U.S. Air Force, only 29% are combat effective, able to fly. <laughs> it's like, man, that's, uh, I mean, I forget which member of Congress described it. Maybe it was Matt Gates, uh, his $100 million paperweight. Yeah, that's a, you know, that about summarizes. About right, man. Then you get the U.S. Navy. Uh, so we're, they're in the process of decommissioning 17 ships because they don't have enough sailors to, uh, to man them. Uh, just the other day in the Persian Gulf, uh, there, there's this, they have a ship. It's part of the U.S. Navy. It's not an official, it's not a, a Navy ship per se, but it's sort of like the merchant fleet, merchant marine fleet. They're called oilers. An oiler is a floating gas station. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. Because it goes along, it has to accompany the nuclear powered aircraft carrier. And I'm sure some of your listeners will be going, well, what the hell do you need uh, oil on a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier? Well, there are these things called combat jets. You know, uh, just go watch Tom Cruise in Top Gun. Yeah. Those run off of oil, getting out of petroleum-based products. So that's where the oiler comes in. Well, uh, this oiler, when they're in the Persian Gulf, ran aground. You know, I don't know if this skipper was drunk or what, uh, but Ben's... Uh, it bent the uh, rudder, and then it also flooded, partially flooded the engine compartment. In other words, the oiler ain't oiling anymore, okay? Not available for service. Turns out they don't have a backup for it. Now the Navy's scrambling to figure out, oh, we've got to find some way to get fuel out there, because otherwise, if they do get into combat operations against Iran, those planes might be able to fly to maybe three sorties, and then they're out of gas, and then they're sitting ducks. So, you know, across the board, I don't care where we're talking, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, you know, the Marines are, they're so small, they're, they're, you know, they're they're not a big issue, but they don't have, you know, they're not a great size, I think, what are they, 80,000 people now? Um, But then you get into the supply chain issues. It used to be that the United States, you know, what what happened in World War II was once the the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and they created the conditions that we were, America was ready to enter the war, the factories that turned on and sprung up really uh, uh, ended up funding a whole generation of wealth. It created an enormous amount of wealth in this country and uh, full employment and the factories were everywhere. Um, Today, and and I use I've used this in several you know several other times when I've uh, appeared on different shows. Uh, you know, I graduated from high school fifty years ago. You know, fifty one now. Oh, uh, at my high school reunion last October seventh of all times, um, it, it, I was chatting with some of my buddies from, uh, and we were we were discussing what it was like fifty years ago, and I grew up in Independence, Missouri. Went to school, middle school, across the street from Harry Truman's house. Harry Truman was still alive then, and so you could see President Truman walk in the streets. 
you know, he's one of the, you know, I admire him probably most of all presidents because he's the only guy who got into the presidency, wanted, and didn't come away a wealthy man. So, I mean, he, he continued to live with his mother-in-law for a while, even after he got out of the White House. She was a cranky old lady. Um, but back then when we were in high school, my father was a, he was a, a maintenance foreman at a steel plant. One of my other buddies' father was a, he was, he was a chief foreman at Standard Oil Refinery. Others worked at Bendix Corporation, Alice Chalmers, which manufactured farm implements, sort of like John Deere, uh, General Motors Leeds plants. What was there? There were a variety of solid manufacturing jobs that created a real economic middle class, a, a, a strong foundation of a middle class where you could afford vacations as a family. Uh, you know, I had the th uh, three other siblings. So we're a family of six, and we could still take a vacation uh, every year. Oh, so dad and mom, it was solid middle class. When we go back today, 50 years later, that's all gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sheffield Steel closed. Bendix, gone. Uh, uh, Standard Oil Corporation, shut down, gone in Sugar Creek. So what are the options, economic options for people coming out? Not many. So here's the United States now. We're producing 155 millimeter shells. And uh, I guess we had sort of an expectation of how many would be fired per day that uh, we anticipated that, oh, somebody might fire a uh, hundred per day. Well, all of a sudden you get into the war in Ukraine and the Ukrainians are firing uh, a thousand a day, you know, 10 times what maybe was calculated. And on top of it, the Russians are firing 6,000 back. So be able to do six times the amount, we discovered we can't make shells fast enough. We don't have that ability. Uh, Patriot, again, Patriot missiles, we've run out of those. Attack them's run out of those. Uh, they're, they're sending what are called JSAMs, which is a, a missile that's launched from the air, air to surface missile. And those are, uh, those are old, but the reason we're sending those is we still got some of those left. We've exhausted our inventory. United States does not have uh, an inventory. And then on top of it, I've got, I forgot the, you get the list of the particular weapon systems, but there are at least 12 weapon systems that are considered critical for the United States that are dependent utterly on parts that are produced in China. And so what are we trying to do? Well, trying to start a war with China, right? trying to antagonize China. And I'm, I'm not trying to pretend China's some mecca for human rights or, you know, it's the greatest country in the world. But I, I, I guess I've gotten to the point in life where I think we just ought to mind our own damn business, fix our own problems first. And then, you know, if, if once I'm free and clear of debt, once I've got ample savings in the bank, then I can go around and tell other people how to get out of debt and put some savings away. But when I'm indebted, you know, beyond what I can make, and I'm out offering financial advice, sure as hell shouldn't listen to me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and that's, that's sort of the position we're in militarily. Yeah. Here's the United States advising Ukraine. Yeah, we're going to tell you how to win this war. And the Ukrainians should have said, I have a question. What's the last war you guys won? Uh, the, 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 I guess it'd be World War II. Yeah. That'd be World War II. We didn't win Korea. We had to have a negotiated settlement there. We walked out of Vietnam. We lost that. We want to pretend, oh yeah, we, we could have beat them. We just, we just weren't trying. Oh, please. Yeah, I, I, I've had that discussion. I can't have that discussion really with some of my friends who are a little older who fought in that. They get real defensive over, but it's like, you know, guys face it. Uh, Iraq, you know, we're still there, but it's no, definitely not. They're not. They're not throwing uh, garlands uh, at us. The, they're going to be throwing grenades at us. Uh, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, we walked out on. We had to get out and escape. You know, so and here we are offering Ukraine advice on how to fight Russia. Right. Well, you know, how's that turned out? 
Yeah, Ukraine, Ukraine's getting getting beat and beat badly, despite yeah. all the propaganda out of the West to the contrary. So how does this, um, what's the next step in that war, if you would, is, um, I know you're on record and you think Zelensky is going to be replaced sometime. Um, there will be just a forced settlement. I guess it'll be more on Russia's terms. Um, yeah. but yeah, tell me, talk to me about that. How does that end? Yeah, this, you know, now the West is trying to hint around, oh, we're going to do some negotiations. And Russia's not going to negotiate. Why? They don't need to. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, it's like, um, they, they, they've already got a job. They're already making seven figures and you want to come to negotiate with them about uh, a six figure job. What, what's there to talk about, right. you know, because, uh, they, they, they've learned that they can't trust the West. They trusted the West with respect to Vince one, Vince two, and They've now, as you mentioned earlier, they've adjusted their nuclear doctrine. Previously, uh, they would they would only respond if attacked directly by a nuclear power. Now they've amended that, and they've said if a nuclear power like the United States or, or the United Kingdom provide weapons to a third party to a state that is then used, and that state then attacks. Russia with those weapons. Russia will consider that an act of war by the nuclear power mm -hmm. and, will, and will respond accordingly. It doesn't mean they'll initially respond with nu nukes, but they will attack, they will respond militarily. Well, that is exactly what the United States and UK have been doing up to this point. They've been providing Ukraine with weapons that are being used to attack inside Russia. But now, Ru now Russia's saying, We've tolerated that in the past. We're not going to tolerate that anymore going forward. We're putting you on notice. If they attack inside inside Russia again, we're holding you accountable. That's number one. Uh, the Russians militarily have stepped up uh, their advance in, in Donetsk in particular, as well as in Luhansk, and they are moving very quickly to the west. Of course, the Dnieper River, and where it is proven that Ukraine doesn't have the ability, they don't have the manpower, the trained manpower in particular, to stop them. So uh, I think this is ultimately going to end in a military defeat by Ukraine. It will be an unconditional surrender. <laughs> Russia's, Russia's not going to come in and say, okay, well, we'll let you keep your weapons. No, keep your military intact. No. Russia's going to insist on dismantling the Ukrainian military. It's going to be unable to ever participate, join in NATO in any form or fashion. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it, it, if Ukraine survives, and there's some real questions whether or not Ukraine can survive this, because when, when it is going to lose all the territory that's east of the Dnieper River, mm -hmm. when they now go through Kiev. And they may even lose Kiev. Because Kiev, within Russian history, is is the birthplace of uh, Christianity in Russia. Number one, uh, so it has long been considered, you know, not so much part of Ukraine. It, Ukraine is a recent creation, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, the, the Russian history goes way back. So uh, Russia has control of that, and the incredible mineral wealth that's in that uh, eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, oil, coal, um, gold, rare earth minerals. Uh, it is, so it's just, uh, think about the, this comparison. The Russia, in terms of natural resources in the world, is number one, right? Number one. I think China, uh, United States, I forget which one's number two, number three. Uh, Ukraine is ranked either number four or five. So it's all right there. Oh yeah. So, I mean, but, but here was the, before the start of the special military operation, Russia was still, you know, had a very strong economy, even though the West kept saying, oh, it's, it's a gas station masquerading as a country, uh, or a country masquerading, masquerading as a gas station, take it whichever way you want. 
uh, that it's the size of Spain, you know, uh, just complete crap. But it, it had a solid middle class. Whereas Ukraine, poorest country in Europe. And then, how and the can you, Europe. How can, how, yeah, well, how can you be the poorest country in Europe when you're number four or five in the world in terms of natural resources? Right. Look, what's going on with that? Well, part of what's going on is you got like Burisma, where you bring in Hunter Biden and former uh, CIA officer Kofi Blath to sit on the board, rake in some big cash. For what? For, you know, running influence to bear in Washington, D.C.? Mm -hmm. um, so what you get in all of this is, is that the, the corruption that was endemic in Ukraine impoverished that country. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I think really the West hates Vladimir Putin. Because mm -hmm. it was 2001, 2002, shortly after Putin had become president. Uh, he called in all the oligarchs, he had a meeting with them and said, hey, this rape of Russia is going to stop and it's going to stop now. Because these, these many the oligarchs, they're, they're uh, uh, tied up or partnered up with uh, oligarchs in the West. And, and uh, the, the wealth was being taken out of Russia. It was being sent overseas. And the Russians had lost control of their economy. And Putin said, basically, yeah. no, this is, this is going to stop now. And here's mm -hmm. your choice. Mm -hmm. I do, you play along. And oh, the other thing is, get out of politics. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be having you meddle in politics anymore. Make money. Fine, you can make the money. But it stays here in Russia. We're going to invest in Russia. In 1999, a buddy of mine who moved over there then uh, to take a job with a law firm. He's American. He described Mo Moscow then as a veritable shithole. You know, outdated infrastructure, crumbling streets, just, you know, it, it, was, it was a nightmare. Today, 24, 25 years later, wow. Yeah. Moscow is incredible. Incredible. Clean, modern, um, thriving middle, thriving middle class. It's not it's not one of these uh, uh, great wealth differences between the oligarchs and the peasants. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's what, that's what uh, Putin did. He put a stop to that. A couple, you know, posted him like uh, man, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky. So he wound up in prison. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was, uh, you know, several of them were, were Jewish. So that, that added, you know, another whole international flair to the United States being accused the Russians being accused of being anti-Semitic for going after these you know, Jewish oligarchs who were not putting the motherland first. They were putting themselves first. That's what I think that in part goes to explain why there's such hatred of Russia. But now look at what's taking place. Yeah. Russia's economy has been booming. I mean, they've had to ramp up and do some things. Their biggest problem is a manpower shortage. But they're bringing some of those in from North Korea and some other places. Yeah. Uh, you're going to find that, um, you know, the, when the partnership that is forged now between China and Russia, uh, the conventional analysts in the West see this as that Russia is the junior partner, China is the senior partner. I think it's going to be the other way around mm -hmm. because uh, China is going to wind up in a position where it's going to be very dependent upon Russia for oil, uh, natural gas. Uh, energy needs and food, yeah. most importantly, food mm -hmm. to feed its population. Now, it won't, it will, you know, it's not going to be held hostage by the West on the food front. So, uh, you know, what, what we're really w witnessing is the emergence of a new international world order, an economic order, uh, with BRICS at the centerpiece of that. And I don't think people in the West have really fully grasped the possible implications of that because we're so you know we're we're still happily uh, air and i guess entranced with the Bretton woods agreements uh, from post-world war ii and the fact that yeah we went off the gold standard but the dollar is now essentially it's green gold it's this it's international reserve currency but that i 
that that's starting to change because you get a lot of a lot of the big countries, China, Brazil, India, in terms of population. They're starting to do international transactions in their own currencies and getting away from the dollar. Yep. And the Saudis have even indicated, hey, we're going to start uh, necessarily having to do all transactions in, with the dollar. Yep. You know, it's, at some point, this uh, this uh, merry-go-round we've got ourselves on, where we're, we're running up debt so fast, and we're, in the past, the world was willing to enable us to facilitate it. Now, not so much. Yeah. You know. Well, I think um, I've had you on long enough. I want to thank you so much for your time. If people want to um, reach out to you or if, they're, um, if they like this interview and they want to become more familiar with your work sure. and content, where do they go? Uh, Sonar21.com. S-O-N-A-R-2-1.com. Stands for Son of the New American Revolution 21st Century. I say that because I am actually a son of the American Revolution. I have uh, 28 ancestors that fought in the American Revolution. So yeah, I come, I come from a long line of firebrands. But I'm a Native American. I mean, I've been. My family's been different parts of the family have been here for nine, ten generations at least. They go way back. Well, Larry, um, I want to thank you so much for your time trying to uh, explain some things or make sense of all of this chaos. I just uh, have been a big fan, and I just I just really want to thank you for your time. I will put a link to your site in the show notes below this interview. Hey, thank you so much. And it was uh, great to spend the hour with you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks a lot.